Whew. All right, that was gnarly. Solid four foot wind swell at like six seconds at the launch. <sighs> and like a medium high tide. So the waves were breaking just right on the sandbar outside the launch. I was sitting on the inside for about 10 minutes just with my paddle in my hand, ready to punch through and it was just nonstop waves. Yeah, I made it through actually pretty unscathed, but uh, got a little lucky on timing. Had to play it real conservative. And even then I still almost got smacked. So we'll see how it is on the way back in. more than oh shit big fatty green back let's put it in the tank he's a fatty all right guys we got birds working all over this area um they're pretty scratchy they're not concentrated on any bait enough life here that it makes me want to put out a live bait i just caught that big mackerel got a carolina rig here got some more mackerel on the meter underneath me Let's get our Carolina rig ready. Okay, let's put this big fatty on. Oh, doggy. All right, Carolina rig on its way down. <laughs> for bait. Got a nice fatty. This one's even bigger. All right, guys, it's about 6.30. I've been following these birds out to deeper water. I'm in about 150 feet right now. Pulling my Carolina rig behind me. Got my heavy iron ready to drop. Got my surface iron ready to throw. Seeing some splashes around on the surface, but kind of looking just like big mackerel. Have not seen any surface action that I thought was the yellowtail. Um, had a few decent marks, but uh, kind of looking like bonito or barracuda maybe. Not seeing the real big thick marks that I would think for sure was the game fish. Um, so yeah, I followed these birds out to 150 feet. Um, still seeing kind of a scattering layer. Kind of light offshore winds, maybe three to five miles an hour offshore. Winds out of the southeast. Not a single other person in La Jolla. All alone out here. All right, guys, just had some big marks under the boat. Um, could be big mackerel or bonito. Let's drop the eye on the iron and see if we can get a bite. So you can see here the fish that were swimming under the boat about 60 to 80 feet down on the school. Then you can see my iron dropping down past them and uh, did not get any followers, did not get anything chasing my, my iron. Oh, there's a bite. Mackerel. All right, so I got a mackerel on my line here. Just gonna let it freak out, see if I can attract any bigger marks. Really, that's the only way you can learn on your sonar what's what, you know, you gotta, Look at the mark, drop on it, catch something, confirm what it is. All right, this guy's bleeding from the neck a little bit. Looks like I stuck him. Um, he's not doing too bad. This is a real nice big mackerel. I'm gonna go ahead and keep this one. I'm still in this 150 to 160 foot zone. As I said, I wasn't able to catch up to the birds, but I was just gonna kind of lurk 
uh, in the area that they're working and sure enough they came right to me um, I got the turns diving all around me my Carolina rig bait is feeling real nervous I can feel them kind of spazzing out and making little runs um, but yeah I have not seen any fish up on the surface haven't seen them down low so fish finder settings look good let's just run through the settings real quick here for you guys we're on 83 kilohertz full screen is all 83 kilohertz doing 2x scroll speed I also have my amplitude scope here a scope and this actually gives you the raw feedback from the actual return the way the, the chart works is this is the actual sound this is the actual return from the ping and then the scroll is a composite that compiles you know a sequence of these marks so you can't really see the arch until it's out here in the scrolling part but the mark that as it's happening real time happens here on the amplitude scope so when you get a really big fish you'll see it on the amplitude scope first you'll see it here before it even turns into a worm here that's why i use this on 83 kilohertz is because it'll give me a little head start um, when you see a fish and you see a big yellow blob in here, you, you already know it's coming before it even gets on your screen. So go into menu. Uh, you can see that uh, we're, the range is auto. Frequency is 83 kilohertz. Sensitivity is auto plus two. Color line 76. In the advanced settings, I have noise rejection on low, surface clarity low, scroll speed 2x, ping speed max. Try those settings out, see how they work for you. Let me know. Let me know in the comments how these settings work for you. Uh, were you able to get a better return using these settings or was it not right for your fish finder? Or maybe your waters are different and these settings don't work well for you. Bait's moving around quick. It's almost like it's getting pushed around. Um, let's stay on the move, see if we can find. All right guys, let's check this bait. Make sure it's still swimming good. Still feels pretty strong. All right, so mackerel looks good. Hook's not twisted. Still lively. Yep, he's going back. Let me uh, cover my setup that I'm using for the heavy iron. Right now I'm uh, throwing a Salus 6X Heavy in, in white. Um, this is for dropping down to the bottom when I see marks. Um, I have that tied with a Palomar knot onto 40 pound mono. Okay, for my reel, I got my uh, trusty Saltist BG30H. For my rod, I got an Ugly Stick Tiger in medium heavy, seven foot. Um, I like a little bit of backbone for fishing mono on the heavy iron, get some good stretch. I'm not gonna be too close to the kelp, so uh, three or 400 yards away from the kelp edge. So pretty safe out here if I hooked up. But uh, if I did hook something and it started running towards the kelp, I might get a little nervous with this long mono top shot and uh, button the drag, try to horse him or try to get him to turn back to deep water. All right guys, we're still on the hunt here. Um, it's about 8.30 in the morning sun is out it's getting warm time to strip down get the uh get the tactical bass and hoodie off get the waders off and get down to trunks and get some vitamin d here in a drift in about 127 feet and I wanted to uh, talk to you guys about a little bit about my tackle and my tactics um, lately I've been fishing Carolina rig with on the last couple of videos with you guys but one rig that I fish all the time is the reverse dropper loop so um, I want to show you guys how I tie the reverse dropper loop um, first off the tackle that I'm using is um, I'm tying it onto mono I believe this is about 30 or 40 pound mono um, right and then I have my 10 ounce torpedo weight and my J hook live bait hook I think that's about a three yacht I believe 
All right, so the way I tie my dropper loop is, maybe some of you guys know that there is a knot called the dropper loop knot. Um, I'm not a fan of the dropper loop knot. It uh, puts a lot of abrasion on the line, puts a lot of friction, and it can uh, cause your line to weaken or uh, abrade as you're, um, as you're tying it and stitching it down. So what I like to use is the spider hitch knot, and I find the spider hitch knot's actually much stronger than the, uh, than the dropper loop knot. So for dropper loops, I will pretty much only use a spider hitch. And that's um, whether it's a reverse dropper loop or a regular dropper loop. Um, the difference is on a regular dropper loop, the weight is on the very end of the line and the hook is on the loop. Reverse dropper loop is the opposite. The weight is on the loop and the hook is on the main line. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna use a spider hitch knot to tie a reverse dropper loop, okay? So we'll grab our line here, and then I want to measure out about enough line that I'm going to be able to tie my knot, and you have enough line for my leader on the end. So maybe like four or five feet up the line, okay? First thing I'll do is I'll take my weight, and I will feed one end of the line through the weight, and then bring that all the way up to where I want my loop to be. So I'm pulling the line through the hoop, all right, so now I got, my weight is directly on my line, just one time through, okay? Then I'm gonna measure out about that much line, I'd say it's about, I don't know, 10, 12 inches worth of line, all right? And I'm gonna double it together and hold both ends in my hand like this. So you can see I've got the weight over here, and I've got both ends here, pinched in my thumb. All right, so next step, I'm gonna take this line and I'm gonna do one loop. Right? And you want this loop to be big enough so that you can put your weight through it, all right? So we got our loop, we got our hook, our weight, right? Now I'm gonna use the, take the weight and I'm gonna pass it over my thumb three times. One, two, three. So now this, I left myself a little, not quite not enough room, but I still have my loop here and I've gone around my finger twice and this is the third one. So I'm gonna take my weight bring it through the loop, and then I'm gonna slowly pull the loops off my thumb, okay? And then I'm just gonna pull this slowly together, you can see, until it gets pretty tight. Um, and then I'm gonna use my little bit of saliva to lubricate the knot, and I'm gonna give it a nice little tug here. You can see how that kind of cinched down, but it's not ready yet. So, next, on that time I was pulling on the weight, right? So I'm pulling on the loop. The way to make this come together correctly is you got to pull on the loop to get the initial cinch, but to get it to cinch all the way correctly, you have to pull on the main line. So now I'm taking the main line that goes to the rod and the part of the leader that's going to go back to the hook, and then I'm cinching it together like that, okay? See how that thing just went right together? All right, now I'm just going to check it again with one more, check it again, one more pull here. Right, and then I'm gonna just test it here to make sure that I didn't screw it up. Okay, it's real strong. So now what I'll do is, I wanna make it so this weight will break off if it gets hung up. So what I'll do is I'm gonna tie an overhand knot in the loop, okay? So you can see, here's my loop, my spider hitch is up here, and I'm just tying an overhand knot kind of loosely, right? So now if this weight gets hung up and starts really pulling, it's gonna break here at this overhand hand knot. Um, and then hopefully, if there's a fish on it, my main line will stay intact. So you can see my spider hitch is here. I got an overhand knot there and 10 ounce on the bottom, right? All right, so there's my loop. Now, I'm gonna take, go down to the end of the line here, and I'm gonna attach my hook with a Palomar knot. So those, you guys probably mostly know the Palomar knot. I'm gonna go through once. Go back through the same way, right? So now I have a loop hanging out the outside. I'll take that, twist it over itself like so, pass this loop through, pass the end loop through the loop that I created. So I kind of have a doubled over overhand knot here, as you can see. And then I'll take my hook and pass it through the end loop. So you can see here. 
a little bit of spit for lubrication. I'm gently cinching it together. You just want to make sure that this loop doesn't go over the eyelet. So I'm going to pinch the very end of it like this and pass it like that. Then I'll pull on each side just to make sure it's nice and tight and all the slack is taken out of it. Okay. I'll use my scissor to take off my tag end and I will make sure to keep my mono in the boat, not throwing my fishing line in the ocean. Okay. So I got my weight. And my main line of about four feet. That's looking like five feet, but that's okay. And there's my hook on the end. So that's the reverse dropper loop. Um, I usually use eight to 16 ounce weights and I'm dropping on Marks pretty fast with that. Um, it'll get down real quick. All right, so that's the reverse dropper loop, guys. Um, when will I use reverse dropper loop versus regular dropper loop? Um, I'll almost never use a regular dropper loop with livey fin bait. The reason why is when it's up on that loop, it'll just spaz out and twist and get it all screwed up. Um, the lively baits do much better on the lively baits do much better on the end of that long line fishing with greenbacks or maybe larger Spanish mackerel or any kind of lively fin bait I'll fish that reverse dropper loop if I'm fishing squid or maybe a tiny tiny little sardine or a tiny Spanish that's not gonna spaz out too much and flip out on the hook maybe I'll put that on a regular dropper loop but yeah that's pretty much my strategy for the dropper loop probably one of my favorite ways to catch fish because um, you can just drop on them with like surgical precision all right, guys, we got a nice mark at 80 feet. Big ass mark. I like the look of that. Let's see if we can get it interested in my jig. Damn, that's a fat mark. Looks real good. All right guys, we're way inside by the canyon edge. Still tons of birds and bait out here, but uh, have not seen any of those big marks. Had that big mark earlier that we thought might've been a fish, um, didn't get a bite on the iron or on the Carolina rig. Um, so yeah, gonna go to work, gonna call it now, gonna bring in my Carolina rig and release my bait here on the edge of the canyon and and head inside. Um, so we'll see you guys at the launch. All right, I don't know if you guys can see that, but that was about a three to four foot set of about four, four waves coming through the launch at about eight second interval. So the exact waves that you don't want to have. Um, so anytime you're coming in, you want to stop well outside the surf line and just sit and watch. You're watching for the sets. Like if you don't surf, it's a, it's a term in surfing. The sets of, you know, the waves come in sets typically, and then you'll have a lull between the sets. So typically you're wanting, you're wanting, I want to sit here, I want to see when, how many, how often the sets are, how much time between them, and uh, what the waves look like in between the sets because I need to push through. Um, basically I'm waiting for the big set to come, the biggest waves, and then I'm going to sprint in right after that wave came and try to ride on the back of the small one. Um, could backfire on me big time, um, but that's yeah, been okay. I'm no expert on the Hobie landing. There's a lot of other people out there who are much more skilled than me, but I'm still learning. Low tide's always gonna be an easier launch or a landing, typically than a high tide, when there's uh, some swell in the water. So if you're able to time it so that you can uh, try to land on the low tide if you can, uh, in my experience, it's helped out a lot. Um, high tide can be very tricky.
uh, once again, no luck on the yellowtail. I think it's important that I show these videos where I get skunked though, because before you guys were kind of only seeing the videos where I was catching multiple fish or a big yellow or a big white sea bass, and you don't really see all the times that I go out and don't catch anything. You know, maybe I see some sign, but uh, pretty slow today. Uh, I don't think I had too many opportunities for the game fish. I think they had that one mark um, that we'll probably talk about in the video. I thought I had a really nice mark dropped on it, but I did not get the fish to react to my bait. Um, so yeah, probably had one shot at a nice game fish, but uh, no luck, no bites. Uh, trolled the Carolina rig all day for nothing. And uh, looking nice out there. There's definitely some green patches of about five foot visibility, but current is still uphill and not looking great. Um, next week could be a whole different ball game, so we'll be on it again. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys like the uh, dropper loop tips. Um, you know, it's probably my most favorite way to fish, other than the heavy iron. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, got lucky at the launch. Didn't bit, but almost, almost totally yard sailed there. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. And again, if you guys are new to the channel, I would love it if you subscribe to the channel. Maybe leave me a comment and let me know some suggestions of stuff that I can do in future videos. But uh, until next time, we'll see you at the launch.